Guys, it's just a vampire skull. <laughs> Lick it. <laughs> Reapers, what is good? It's your boy Laser. He's a Laser back with another scary reaction video. He's on the scary content. So you can do the video for you guys. We're the top five scares of vampires in literature. Guys, I'm a vampire myself. <laughs> I wish I had fangs. But if you guys want the scary content, you guys want more scary music feature, it's the select button. You subscribe me to a notification bell icon. Let's dive straight into the video. Vampires are back in business, and truth be told, despite many forms of questionable fiction, trying its damnedest to take away the eternal swagger and glamour that comes with being an immortal blood-sucking demigod, vampires have never not been cool. Yeah. Because, thankfully, despite for the most part their pale ashen image being driven through the mud for a while, on the sidelines... I'm very a vampire myself, I mean, I'm kind of pale. Literature has always been consistently creating some of the most awesomely terrifying depictions of the bloodthirsty paragons of gore and immortality that we love. Thankfully for us, there are some awesome entries to choose from for this list, so let's get to it. Hello horror fans, what's going on? And once again, welcome back to the Scariest Channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. As per usual, I'll be your horror host, Jack Finch, as today we curiously take a look at the Top 5 Scariest Vampires in oh, literature. Shit. Roll clip. Sometimes the world no longer needs a hero. I'm the hero, bitch. Sometimes what it needs is a monster. And you believe you know what it is to be a monster. <laughs> For the curious amongst you, that clip was from the massively underrated 2014 semi-historical vampire pseudo-slasher Dracula Untold, which is a surprisingly awesome vampire flick and pretty fitting for this blood-based literature list. Because come on, we all know that vampires in literature are massively underrated anyway, for the most part. And that's because, while the progenitor of all vampire fiction, Bram Stoker's Dracula, is always held up as the benchmark for it, and often to its detriment because I've got news for you, Vampires have evolved, man, and now they're much more terrifying. Obviously, we have to pay our dues to Dracula, though, but from an even deeper stance of literature, we have to give homage to John Polidori's I'll let a vampire suck my blood any day. Dracula, come at me. A vampire with a Y, written way back in 1819, the progenitor of <laughs> even Dracula himself. Vampires, man, they're ancient. Kicking off at number five, I am legend. Zombie vampires. Who knew that such a hodgepodge could become a genuinely terrifying hallmark of literature? Well, for I forgot, I thought this movie was like zombies. It was vampires. I could have swore it was zombies. For those of you that have read Richard Matheson's phenomenal 1950, I think this is the book. I don't know about the movie. For sci-fi horror, I am legend. You'll know that's exactly what it is. Genuinely terrifying. And although it was a half decent movie, please don't lump this novel in with the 2007 half decent and Will Smith blockbuster because the entire film kind of missed the point. But hey, that's not why we are here, is it? Written by Richard. Wait, he just disrespected the movie, what the fuck? Matheson, I Am Legend tells a tale of Robert Neville, a reluctant scientist and the sole survivor of a vile pandemic that has ravaged the planet, a blood plague that seemingly turns humans into vampires. Throughout the opening of the novel, it is alluded to that this plague was a result of a devastating war, and this plague was openly spread via mosquitoes kicked up in the subsequent debris of society, which, you know, is already a pretty terrifying- Oh no! Look at that fucker! Shiver me timbers. Uh, uh, notion, because that could happen. Now, I won't get into too much detail about the actual narrative because there is a about. lot to be enjoyed in this novel. And if you can get your hands on it, I'd highly recommend reading it. It's not too long at all, and Matheson paints a vividly bleak picture throughout. The reason that I. Those motherfuckers should be burned on fire, bruh. They get the whole squad being burned on fire. Oh shit, like my ancestors. I'm legend zombie vampire plague ridden carriers end up on this list though is because of Matheson's attention to scientific detail. And as Robert Neville scours the wasteland of Los Angeles, learning more about the swarms of fleshy, bloodthirsty rippers that roam the streets at night, we're gradually given a real sense of physic. Yeah, don't lie guys, we've all seen just a vampire during the day, bro. You know, he's coming out of his tunnel and he accidentally mistakes the day for... Uh, for the night, but he comes out, bro, and, oh, he melts. That's what happens when vampires see daylight, right? They melt, right? Is that what happens? Locality <laughs> as to the bleak, feral existence Matheson's vampires are subject to. And I won't even go into detail about the ending without fear of spoilers, but if you're partial to a bit of existentialism in vampire literature, then please read this novel because its ending is a whole different kettle of fish. It will make you think twice about vampire folklore and the legend that comes with it. I am. <laughs> Swinging it at number four. Fever Dream. Again, if you're in the mood for a fantastically written, dream. relatively concise novel about yeah. terrifying vampires and the resounding implications that... 
My whole life is a fever dream, bro. Come with immortality, please read George R.R. R. Martin's fantastic 1982 novel, Fever Dream. And yes, that's correct, before George was weaving Westeros and creating perhaps the finest fantasy series ever written, he was also indulging himself on immortal vampires that commandeered a Mississippi riverboat in the mid 1800s. Yeah. Now, if I had to choose purely from a technical perspective, Fever Dream may actually be one of the most complete and compelling works of vampire fiction ever written. If you're a fan of Martin's prose, then you'll find exactly the same kind of verve and style here and what it serves to do is wholeheartedly humanize his immortal vampire this is a very beautiful picture purple like me bro look at my purple and then look at this purple picture behind me very beautiful and turn them into a much more complex kind of monster like with most of martin's work look at the blood on his face look at the bloody water let me drink some blood Look, there is no blood. Why do fuckers actually drink each other? Why do these celebrities actually drink each other's blood, bro? It's so weird. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but like, ugh. Well, I'm probably gonna do it in the future. I don't, I don't know. Probably not. Maybe. White here, but instead shades of grey. And as you may imagine, that's a pretty difficult thing to do with vampires. However, the reason it only makes its way in at number four, though, is that purely from a horror perspective, it's not entirely as terrifying as some of our other entries. But in terms of depth and complexity, Fever Dream is second to none. It tells the tale of Abner Marsh, a grizzled steamboat captain in the mid-1800s, who is down on his luck during a particularly bleak financial crisis, but is then contacted by a mysterious, soft-spoken aristocrat, a man named Joshua York, who promises to finance a brand new riverboat for Abner, an opulent vessel named Fever Dream. And whilst obviously, yes, this novel is centred on vampires, I'll say no more because the way the immortal society of vampirism is woven into this novel is a beautiful thing to witness. Vampires. Vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and the subsequent opposing blood masters that are spawned from it is a concept rarely looked at in vampire fiction. Two words, Vampire Jesus. Next up at number three, The Vampire Court. And whilst throughout the fantastic Dresden File series by Jim Butcher, there are many forms of vampires and the subsequent vampire courts that come with them, there's no doubting that the most terrifying, malevolent, and purely evil vampire organization is the White Court. Although, thankfully for us, they're all pretty damn evil anyway. And Harry Dresden has been doing his damn this to bring about their downfall one by one, as is the case with the Red Court. Sorry, spoilers. Now, vampires in Jim Butcher's universe what's come he, in. What's he holding? Is that like a staff? I don't know what that is, bro. Many different shapes and forms, almost like a melting pot of pretty much every vampire custom and creation that we've seen in fiction, which is pretty damn awesome. Dude, whenever I think of vampires, like, you always just think of, like, the classic, like, the good old white face with the bloody lips and then the fangs, but then, like, we forget that, like, now vampires are like portrayed as that, you know what I'm saying? And oh my god, I wish I was this fucker. What the fuck is going on with this fine ass bitch? Oh no, she could lick my insides any day. Lick my insides. <laughs> Awesome in its own right, but it's with the societal structure and ancient hierarchy where Butch's vampires truly shine. The White Court, for example, is an order of vampires that feed purely from human emotion, and they satiate their hunger through the consumption of essentially the human spirit. Because of their propensity for life force rather than actual human blood, the White Court prefers to avoid any direct confrontation with their enemies, and for the most part, they're a court of schemers and ploy makers hidden within the shadows, pulling the strings. Essentially, the White Court are the East Indian trading company of the vampire world, and they pull the strings on the rest of the blood sucking. motherfuckers in Gotham, bruh. <laughs> This motherfucker's literally in Gotham right now, what the fuck? Immortals around them. On the other hand though, there was also the Red Court, a vile sect of fleshy, bat-like humanoid creatures that use the glamour of a skin mask to disguise themselves as humans, living and preying on society for years on end. As more akin to the traditional vampires of legend, the Red Court were particularly dark in their approach to feasting off of human blood, and operated mainly in Central and South America, where they reared entire villages of humans like cattle to feed upon. Then there's the Black Court, a diminished sect of vampires who were essentially born from the oh, shit. stereotypical Dracula of legend but were hunted and eventually destroyed thanks to Bram Stoker's novel which in Butcher's universe was published as a how-to guide for the layman to hunt down and kill vampires. Don't you just love the Dresden Files? Swinging in at number two, The Vampiri. We cannot make this list without laying down Brian Lumley's incredible Necroscope series and I'm fully aware that many of you top five scary viewers are particular fans of his resounding. It's like a fossil or like a werewolf bro. Ow! 
Oh, no, no, I have fossil stuck in my throat. Oh, <laughs> my ear's itchy. What the fuck? Don't worry, guys. Don't lie, guys. Whenever our ear's itchy, we just take our knife, bro. Ah! <laughs> horror series. The thing is, though, Lumley completely shook up the concept of what makes a vampire so fervently that in some cases, it's hard to tell where monster of folklore legend begins and alien parasitic monstrosity ends. And believe me, don't worry, I say that as a good thing, not a bad thing. In Lumley's Necroscope series, first written in 1986, gone are the classic interpretations of the vampire legend, and instead, Lumley's vampires are a leech-like parasite from an ancient world deep in the cosmos. Through a painful and grotesque process, these alien leeches Oh shit, what the fuck? Attach to their host and begin a symbiotic life cycle that grants them their immortality of legend, as well as many other devious superhuman machinations. What makes Lumley's vampiri so awesome though is that they're essentially the vampire version of Marvel symbiotes and their life cycle is wholly similar to that of a fungal creature transforming Bro has like a shit ton of fungus in his mouth bro uh. Forming its host through a slow spore ridden process that turns them into the immortal villains that populate Lumley's Necroscope series. Because of that incredibly unique process though, the vampiri leeches can also infect other non-human entities such as in a few cases foxes or wolves and then so begins Lumley- Bite me, how about that? Can you bite me? <laughs> Please? Uh -huh. Lumley's absolutely awesome fictional explanation as to the nature of werewolves and lycanthropes that populate his horror series. It's never been done before. The thing is, in Necroscope, the vampiri are so damn ancient and so adept at understanding the parasitic process that created them in the late- <sighs> Guys, it's just a vampire skull. <laughs> Lick it. <laughs> Later series, they move into an entire industry of breeding lesser versions of vampires to enact their bidding, whether across the earth or on star side. In fact, Lumley's depiction of vampirism in the Necroscope series is pretty damn bleak, and the one true evil against humanity are the vampiri, because eventually, even the most purest of hearts succumb to their evil will. Also, vampire cannibalism. Yeah, that one's not been done that much before. Hmm. And finally, number coming one. in at number one spot, the higher vampire. And whilst we're talking about hunting vampires, we cannot talk about bloodthirsty monsters in literature without taking note on the resounding works of Andrzej Sapkowski with The Witcher Saga that rightfully deserves its place at our number one spot. Now, in my opinion, Sapkowski's depiction is the most complete, compelling, and intriguing creation of vampires in horror in the whole of literature. And I know that's pretty damn high. Motherfucker thinks he's Wolverine all of a sudden, bro. Look at those Wolverine claws. Oh. Hyperbolic, but really, if you've read his work or played any of CD Projekt Red's fantastic video game series, you'll know exactly the impact that vampires have on this world. And I say world because the most intriguing Purple notion like of vampires in the Witcher Saga is that, not unlike Lumley's Necroscope series, these ancient entities are from another planet entirely. Well, not exactly another planet so to speak, but another dimension, another sphere. Now, I'll try not to spoil anything, but to be fair, speaking about the conjunction of the spheres isn't exactly giving anything away. In Sapkowski's world, vampires aren't created or turned or otherwise conjured into existence. Look at all their blood. <laughs> Distance, they're born just like humans are and exist as corporeal beings who can manipulate their body at a molecular level in blood and matter just as easy as we can breathe. Over a thousand years before the Witcher Saga began, during the conjunction of the spheres, different realities where monsters and magical entities reside freely on their- I always thought crows were cool as fuck, bro. I think crows are like red eyes. Oh, so fucking cool. Bro's just like me. I have blood devil eyes. Some people dye their eyes like colors, but I'm never gonna do that. You know, is there a way I could like make my eyes like red, but without actually like do it, like dyeing them red, like or tattooing them red? Whatever the fuck you call it, I will never have my eyes tattooed, bro. The fuck, hell no, fuck that shit. Own plane collided. Um I don't want my eyes to be. I want. I like my natural color, bro. Hell no. Merged with our world, which eventually necessitated the need for the Order of the Wolf and the many witches that came. I, okay, look, I'm gonna make a play for real. I don't know why, but I feel like I might. Nah. I don't know. Is there a way I can make my eye pupils like red, like without actually tattooing them? Is there a way I could like make my eye pupils like actually red? Or is that the only way? I think it would be cool to have my eye pupils red for like. I don't know. I like my natural eye color. I don't know why people like tattoo their eyeballs, bro. Ugh with it. As you know, someone had to try and keep a lid on all that chaotic magic going on, right? Cheers, Geralt. Honestly, I could speak about the Witcher Saga all day, but as far as vampires are concerned, there is so much to feast on. The Brookster, the Catacan, the 
the Alp, grotesque mutagenic versions of vampires created from humans and the corporeal dimension beings. That are absolutely terrifying. Regis, the awesome ancient vampire who's best friends forever with Geralt, the unseen elder, the list goes on and on. And if you're a fan of vampire fiction and are yet to delve into the works of the Witcher series, please consider this as a reminder because as far as Vampires are concerned, there's nothing else like it. And it's the best for a reason. Well, there we have it, horror fans. That is for the top five. Well, guys, that is it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it, because which one of those vampires was supposed to scare you? Future scared content. He's more scary as the future is to do. I'll see you next one. Peace.